Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March meeting of the Foxborough Historical Society. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jim Leibel. I'm currently the president of the society. And as is customary before we start our meeting, I would ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the Constitution one nation, indivisible, with just and justice for all. Okay. Before we begin our board meeting update, I would like to say that there finally appears to be some light at the end of the tunnel with the COVID, and um, let's hope that that progress continues. Um, however, social distancing requirements still mean that we cannot hold our meetings in the uh, Boyden Library as we customarily do, and we were, the board was in quite a quandary as, as to what to do. But uh, fortunately, um, the Mike Weber suggested that the uh, folks at Foxborough Cable Access could make their facilities available to us, and here we are. It's, um, they have quite a uh, extensive resources and expertise which have been made available to us, including having some uh, pre-get-together meetings to familiarize us all with the, with the equipment, which was uh, just wonderful. So Mike, thank you very much, and to everybody at Foxborough. Um, on a sadder note, I would ask you to join me in remembering Charlie Clifford, who passed on May 12th. Charlie was a much-loved resident of Foxborough who was very active in town affairs, including the Foxborough Historical Society, where he served as president for some years. Uh, so that, thank you to Charlie. That concludes the business portion of our meeting. I would now like to introduce our speaker this evening, who I'm sure is known to many of you, Mr. Paolo de Gregorio, who is going to speak on the Prohibition era in the United States. Any questions you may have for Paolo after the presentation can be communicated as outlined in our members' newsletter. With that said, I will turn it over to Paolo. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here in Foxborough. I'd like to thank the Foxborough Historical Society for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, before I do dive into the material for today, however, I do want to note that uh, we had actually planned this to be uh, this talk to be given as a commemoration of the hundredth anniversary of the beginning of Prohibition, which occurred in 1920. So our talk was originally planned for last year. But um, as we know, 2020 had other plans for us. So uh, here we are in early 2021 talking about prohibition. Now, what was prohibition? What was it all about? And why did the United States end up embarking on what some thought was a noble experiment, but uh, in the end ended up being an experiment that failed dramatically? Prohibition was a desire to eliminate the perceived sins of alcohol in American society. Now, why was that necessary? Well, in the early 19th century, around 1800, 1820, people in the United States drank a lot. It has been estimated that each person in the United States at that time drank up to seven gallons of alcohol per year. Now, that's not alcoholic beverages. That is seven gallons of alcohol. That's for every man, woman, and child in the United States. And if we think about that, um, that's a lot of booze. So what prohibition strove to be, what the goal of prohibition was, was to get rid of the, the baneful influence of alcohol in American society. Now, prohibition itself has its origins in a wide series of reform movements that took place in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. Reform movements such as abolition, reform for mental health, and prison reform, and things like that. And it emerges out of what is known as the temperance movement. The temperance movement was an attempt to uh, eliminate alcohol from 
American society. Now, why would the temperance crusaders, uh, and you see a famous one there on your screen, Carrie Nation, why did they dislike alcohol? Why did they think that alcohol was such a dangerous thing for American society? Well, part of it had to do with the perception that alcohol caused all the evils in American society. Poverty, spousal abuse, murder, crime in general, all was caused because people drank too much. So we see emerging in the 19th century this idea that if we get rid of alcohol, if we get rid of the thing that causes the sin, we can get rid of the sin and we can improve society in general. Now, you'll notice there's a cartoon on the uh, left-hand side of the screen that shows sort of the, um, the idea that the temperance crusaders had. What you see is the husband who is um, very far into his bottle, has committed a heinous crime, has murdered his wife. So this idea that alcohol caused sin, that alcohol led to the problems in American society, was one of the underlying ideas of the temperance movement. Now, it does go a little bit deeper than that. It wasn't just that alcohol was a sin and caused problems. There was also a little bit of anti-immigrant sentiment that fueled the temperance movement. Because by the middle of the 19th century, you did have large numbers of immigrants coming to the United States, coming from places like Ireland. And they brought with them a social tradition, a cultural tradition of drinking. Not only that, but alcohol was an important part of religious ceremony for Irish Catholics. So what we see as one of the, the fuels of the temperance movement is a nativism here in the United States, an anti-Irish, anti-Catholic sentiment that really looms large in American society. In any case, the temperance movement does begin to gain traction in the middle of the 19th century. And people like Carrie Nation, again there with the hatchet on the screen, did play a role in publicizing the idea of temperance. Uh, here is a car contemporary cartoon of Miss Nation. Now, she developed a fearsome reputation among the saloon keepers and uh, alcohol distributors of the Midwest, particularly the Kansas Territory, because she used to um, go into many of these saloons, hatchet in one hand and Bible in the other, and go and smash the place up while reading Bible verses. So she very much tied the fight against alcohol with uh, Christian identity and with the idea of eliminating sin. So Carrie Nation, a colorful character in American history. Now, by the time we get to the early 1860s, in the late 1860s and 1870s, the temperance movement has gained national traction. It begins as kind of local institutions in Massachusetts, in New York, in some of the, the Western states. But by the late 1860s, we see the development of a couple of national temperance organizations, national temperance groups. The oldest one and one of the most important ones was the Prohibition Party, which was a political party that was formed with its main platform, the elimination of alcohol in the United States. That was established in 1869. On the screen, on the left-hand side, you see an image of the uh, Prohibition Party's National Convention, which took place in Cincinnati in 1892. They were picking a candidate for the presidency. One of the remarkable things about the Prohibition Party is that it's still around and they still uh, have meetings, they still support political candidates. So you can find a Prohibition Party candidate somewhere near you. The other important organization that emerges in the uh, early 1870s was the Women's Christians Temperance Union, which was, as the name implies, a women's group of Christians who were pushing to get rid of alcohol, to, to reduce the amount of alcohol consumed in the United States. The woman you see on the right-hand side of the screen was Frances Willard. She was the second president of that organization, and she was really the one who pushed it to be a vocal nationwide organization in support of temperance and prohibition. So we see these organizations playing a role in organizing resistance to the uh, use of alcohol and the, the consumption of alcohol in the United States. There was another party that was established in 1893, the Anti-Saloon League. The Anti-Saloon League, 
as the name it tells us was a a vocal opponent to the consumption of alcohol to the drinking of alcohol to saloons across the united states one of its most important figures was its president wayne wheeler who was president from 1902 to 1927. wheeler would play a large role in shaping government policy in the early 20th century when it came to prohibition and when it came to the 18th amendment itself so what we see happening in the United States over the course of the 19th century is that prohibition goes from being a reform movement, basically pushed by uh, uh, Protestant evangelicals and women trying to eliminate the sins in society to becoming a nationwide political movement. And the question about the use of alcohol, the question about temperance did become a potent political question across the United States. You see some images on the screen, political posters and uh, parades in favor of temperance, in favor of prohibition. And the, uh, the group of ladies there on the upper left-hand side of the screen saying, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Um, that was one of the, the main political questions that we see developing in the United States, pushed by these temperance organizations at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century. Yet by the beginning of the 20th century, most Americans were not in favor of temperance, were not in favor of prohibition. Americans still liked to drink. They didn't drink as much as they did in the early 19th century. We certainly weren't quaffing seven gallons of, of rum every year, but we did still have alcohol. Beer was an important product. Rum and whiskeys were important products, not only in terms of uh, social interaction, but also in terms of economy. So the prohibition movement, though gaining nationwide support and gaining public visibility, did seem to be stalling. It wasn't really going to go anywhere until the outbreak of World War I. The First World War breaks out in Europe in 1914, and for more than two years, the United States is kind of watching on the sidelines. We don't want to get involved in that war in Europe. But in April of 1917, the United States does get dragged into the war. We do declare war against Germany, and we become a participant in that struggle over in Europe, in France and in Germany and in other places. And it is with the, the outbreak of World War I and the American involvement in that struggle that we begin to see the imposition of prohibition across the United States. Now, it is important to remember that there were certain states across the Union that had banned the sale of alcohol and the use of alcohol. There was prohibition or uh, uh, temperance on a local level. There were dry towns and dry counties and, yes, dry states. But as a nationwide idea, prohibition had not been introduced. It had not been developed. But with the American entry into the First World War, we do see a win for the prohibition forces. In fact, there, were, uh, there was a period of wartime prohibition where the government passed several laws that limited the production of alcohol in the United States. One of these laws from 1917 was the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act, which gave the government broad powers to regulate commodities, food commodities and fuel commodities, as the name implied. And one of those food commodities that was regulated by the government was grain. Grain was deemed a necessary food product for uh, feeding the nation, for feeding the troops, and yes, for feeding our allies in Europe. And if grain was going to be used as a food source, it could not be used for the production of alcohol. So with the Lever Food and Fuel Control Act, we see grains being removed from use for alcohol production. So wheat and corn and barley and things that would have been distilled into various forms of liquor were no longer available to those distillers. The following year in 1918, the Wartime Prohibition Act was passed. Now, what's kind of um, ironic about the Wartime Prohibition Act is that it was passed in late November of 1918 after the fighting in the First World War had ended with the armistice on November 11th. Yet it does go into effect. And what the Wartime Prohibition Act did was it severely limited the percentage of alcohol that was uh, allowable in beer and other beverages. So what we see with wartime prohibition is the federal government 
very much getting involved in limiting the production, the distribution, and the consumption of alcohol in the United States. Now, at the same time that the Wartime Prohibition Act was going through Congress, there was another piece of legislation making its way through that body, and that was a proposed amendment to the Constitution, a prohibition amendment to the Constitution. In order for that amendment to go into effect, however, it did have to be ratified by three quarters of the states. So in 1918, what would eventually become the 18th Amendment is sent out to the states for ratification. And it needed 36 states to ratify that proposed amendment in order for it to become a part of the Constitution. So for the next year and a half, state after state after state takes up the issue of the Prohibition Amendment, and it is eventually ratified by that 36th state in January of 1919. So this was a, an important moment because with the ratification of the 18th Amendment, it did become part of the Constitution and it did mean that the United States was going to be a dry country. Now, what does the 18th Amendment actually say? Let's take a quick look at the 18th Amendment. It's a very straightforward piece of legislation. It says, after one year from the ratification of this article, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within, the importation thereof into, or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territories subject to the, subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. Basically, booze was not allowed in the United States anymore. You could not manufacture it, you could not sell it, you could not transport it into the United States. From one year, uh, from the date of the ratification of the amendment. Section two says that the Congress and the several states shall have concurrent power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, meaning it wasn't just the federal government's job to enforce prohibition, it was also going to be the state and local government's job to enforce prohibition. So in January of 1919, prohibition is enacted. The amendment is passed and it would go into effect in January of 19, uh, 1920. Now there were some details that had to be worked out because really the first section of this amendment is relatively vague. What do we mean by intoxicating liquors? How do we define an intoxicating liquor? So Congress set to work to give teeth to the 18th Amendment, to come up with an enforcement mechanism of the 18th Amendment. And over the course of the spring and summer of uh, 1919, there was fierce debate in Congress. You had a, a segment of Congress that was uh, firmly in favor of prohibition. They were called the dries. And then you had the section of Congress, the, the sec, uh, sectum, sec, <laughs> section of Congress that was firmly in favor of having alcohol available. And they were known as the wets. So you have the wets versus the dries debating what do we do with this amendment? How do we decide to enforce it? Well, eventually, in October of 1919, the National Prohibition Act was passed into law by Congress. The National Prohibition Act is popularly known as the Volstead Act named after the representative from the state of Minnesota, uh, Representative Volstead, who you see there on the screen. He was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee at that time. Well, the Volstead Act makes its way through Congress and shows up on the desk of the President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson vetoes the act and it goes back to Congress. And there in Congress, the, the legislative body did overturn the presidential veto and the Volstead Act was set to go into operation in January of 1919. Now, what did the Volstead Act actually do? Well, it defined intoxicating liquors as any beverage that had more than one half of 1% alcohol in it. So think about that for a second. One half of 1% of alcohol is not a lot of alcohol in a beverage of any sort. Now, there were exceptions to this ban on prohibition. There were medicinal exceptions. If you had a prescription from your doctor for medicinal whiskey, let's say, you could go to the pharmacy and purchase uh, stronger alcohol in that way with a prescription. There were also uh, exceptions for sacramental alcohols, like sacramental wine. So the Volstead Act did try or did aim to eliminate all alcoholic beverages from the United States with a few exceptions. So what did that actually mean in practicality? Well, it meant 
that in January of 1920, the 18th Amendment went into full effect with the enforcement apparatus of the Volstead Act there behind it, and it led to the scene you see there on the screen, alcohol being booted out of the United States. This was the beginning of, as I said, a noble experiment, a, a, an idea to improve American society by getting rid of what many people consider to be a cause of the problems in American society. But as we will see, prohibition didn't quite work out the way it was intended. So what happens? Well, as soon as prohibition goes into effect, the local, state, and federal authorities have to begin enforcing it. So what we see occurring from 1920 to the late 1920s going to the 1930s are attempts out of enforcing prohibition federal agents, local police officers, uh, going and destroying stores of beer and wine and other alcohols, such as you see displayed here on the, the screen. Uh, all of that beer being dumped into the gutters and in the sewers and the one G-man there smashing the bottles of whiskey. That becomes a very, very common scene throughout the era of prohibition. The government was trying to enforce the law. But the enthusiasm of government officials during the early part of, of prohibition sometimes went a, a little bit to excess. And what we begin to see are criticisms of the authorities, the law enforcement agencies, for being a little bit too zealous in enforcing the idea of prohibition. This cartoon kind of criticizes, uh, as you see, dry enforcement, uh, where the, the law has gunned down an innocent person because he may have had alcohol somewhere around him and the, the moneyed interests there behind the cloud of prohibition are saying, oh, that's too bad, accidents happen, but maybe alcohol was gonna be a cause of something. So we do begin to see a, an attempt at enforcement of the law, but an attempt that sometimes led to uh, overzealousness by those law enforcement authorities. Now, what was the, the broader impact of prohibition, however, on the American public in general? We, as a people, liked to drink. And even though the federal government said, you can't drink, we were not going to be dissuaded from doing so. So the American people, those who wanted to, begin to find other means of finding alcohol finding other places, extra legal places, illegal places in which they could procure the beverages that they desired. So what we begin to see in the 1920s and the 1930s are the rise of the speakeasies. Now, what was a speakeasy? Speakeasy was essentially a, an illegal underground bar or club where patrons who wanted alcohol could get alcohol. Of course, it was against the law. It was against the law to run these, inst these uh, institutions. It was against the law to patronize these institutions. So the speakeasies develop in kind of a, uh, an underground fashion. And in fact, the name speakeasy tells us how they were set up. You weren't supposed to talk about them publicly. You weren't supposed to mention that you were going to get a drink. You were supposed to speak easily whisper it. It wasn't supposed to be public knowledge. Now, often these speakeasies were in nondescript locations, storefronts that had a back room. And if you knew the secret password, like the gentleman on the lower left of the screen, if you knew that secret password or the secret knock at the door, you'd be admitted into the speakeasy where you could uh, slake your thirst, so to say. The speakeasies, speakeasies themselves become places of tremendous uh, social activity where you would have dancing girls and gambling and all that sort of stuff going on. And they were places that were frequented by many, many people. Now, there were speakeasies all across the United States, in every major city, in small towns. If people wanted alcohol, they knew where to go to get alcohol. Uh, that festive group in the upper image that you see there on the uh, upper left, they were uh, celebrating the fact that they were in compliance with the 18th Amendment, no intoxicating liquors allowed on premises while they each had glasses of champagne and a bottle of wine in hand. They were ridiculing the, uh, the 18th Amendment in that image right there. Well, that brings up the question, how did the speakeasies get the booze that they were selling? Where was it coming from? And that gave rise to another group of American entrepreneurs, I guess we could say, the bootleggers. Now, who were the bootleggers? The bootleggers were the individuals who were uh, willing to take a tremendous risk to bring contraband alcohol 
from outside of the United States into the country or from illegal stills set up in the United States to the places of distribution, to the speakeasies in the cities. Uh, bootleggers generally tended to be young men with a lot of time on their hands, oftentimes young men who had fast cars, um, like the gentleman you see in the bottom of the screen. They were willing to take the risk of transporting this illegal material, the booze, the rum, the whiskey, from point A to point B. They did it for profit. It was a business enterprise for them. Now, it wasn't only young men who were involved in bootlegging. Uh, in fact, uh, many young women were involved in the process. Many older people were involved in the process of bootlegging. What we do see among the bootleggers, however, is a a brand of American ingenuity. The fact that the bootleggers in undertaking this illegal activity found ways to avoid the authorities or to hide what they were doing from the authorities. The image on the upper left of the uh, lumber truck is an example of some of the things that uh, bootleggers would do. They would create decoy vehicles that had empty chambers in them where they could store the bottles of beer or the bottles of wine or whatever. You can see on the upper right hand side that Model T that had storage places for all of the bottles that you see laid out in front of it. Or there was that young lady in the bottom right image who was wearing that heavy bulky winter coat. But when that coat is taken off, what do we see? But a series of holsters strapped around her legs where individual bottles of alcohol could be hidden and she could carry them from point A to point B and drop them off at the speakeasies as necessary. So bootlegging did become an American enterprise during the era of prohibition. Now, where did the bootleggers themselves get their alcohol? There were different sources. Uh, sometimes alcohol was brought illegally across the Canadian border into the United States, picked up by the bootleggers and taken to wherever it was needed. Sometimes uh, ships coming from Europe would anchor about three miles off the coast of the United States and the bootleggers would come out in speedboats and pick up the forbidden cargo from those European ships and then bring that into shore on the United States to be distributed uh, across the country. But we also begin to have a homegrown uh, distillation and brewing industry that was taking place in secret illegally uh, away from pry the prying eyes of the authorities. So we do see in the period of prohibition the rise of moonshine and bathtub gin. Now what are moonshine and bathtub gin? Moonshine is a traditional uh, distilled alcohol that had been made for decades out in the, the countryside of the United States, out in Appalachia and in the, the farms of the frontier. It was a way for farmers in that region to get rid of excess grain, grain that was gonna rot unless you did something with it, you turn it into alcohol. Uh, so you were creating grain alcohol. In the late 19th century, the federal authorities actually crack down on the, the making of moonshine. It becomes illegal to do so. Um, the federal authorities were very concerned about the fact that they weren't collecting taxes on the moonshine, which allowed, which forced them to crack down on the illegal distillation of liquors. What we see happening during the period of prohibition is that those moonshiners never went away. Their stills might have been wrecked, but they still had the skills and they begin to rebuild the stills and produce lots and lots of moonshine. There was a growing demand for alcohol in the United States, a growing demand that was fed by homemade production with the, the moonshiners. Now, what was bathtub gin? Bathtub gin gets its name not from the place where the gin was produced or the alcohol was produced, but from the way that the bottles were topped off. Alcohol has to be distilled in a closed system. So you can't make alcohol in your bathtub. But what was happening with bathtub gin was that you would have people setting up stills in their apartments, in their basements, in their garages or in their houses, and they would be making pure grain alcohol, 100% alcohol, 200 proof. You can't drink that, that would kill you. So what they would do is they would pour little bits of alcohol into the bottles and then they top the bottles off by filling them with water that they got out of their bathtubs. Hence the name bathtub gin. These two means become very important for the production of domestic alcohol in the United States. But there was a very severe danger tied to both moonshining and bathtub gin. Not so much for the producers, they were the ones breaking the law and they could have faced uh, criminal charges for that, but for the consumers because there was no legal oversight of what was going into these products. That oftentimes the 
the producers of the alcohol trying to cut corners, trying to maximize their profits, put uh, not healthy products into their drink, put dangerous substances into their bottles of gin, into their bottles of alcohol, and then sold them as pure alcohol. And there are many, many instances of people drinking bathtub gin and going blind or dying because of the contaminated products that were in there. Things like uh, wood rosins and stuff like that were added to the, to the alcohols to fortify them, to make them potent, but also made them very, very deadly. So what we see in the United States when prohibition goes into effect and as the 1920s are creeping along is that more and more Americans became willing lawbreakers. They wanted alcohol, but alcohol was illegal, but they were still going to go out and get the alcohol that they wanted. The uh, images, the cartoons on the screen kind of depict that scene, depict that sentiment in American, uh, American society. You see uh, on the cartoon on the left that there are two kinds of men in this town, bootleggers and customers. That was it. The people who supplied the alcohol and the people who consumed the alcohol. That was it. On the right hand image, you see east side, west side, all around the block, the bootleggers, biz a Russian business at all hours of the clock. Everybody who wanted alcohol knew where to go to get it. And oftentimes the authorities, the law enforcement authorities were looking the other way. Finding somebody who was buying a bottle of booze from a bootlegger wasn't really a big concern for many of the law enforcement officials. So you begin to see a uh, lapse in enforcement of prohibition. It was a period where, as I said, many Americans became willing lawbreakers in order to get the booze that they wanted, to get the liquor that they wanted. They were willing to break the law to... Uh, get in possibly get into trouble and law enforcement authorities authorities were often looking the other way now there is one important aspect of crime in the united states that does get a a big boost from prohibition the 1920s were a golden age for organized crime in this country um, when prohibition went into effect it did not really curtail the demand for alcohol for the American public. So the people who could figure out how to get alcohol to the consumers stood, in a, stood to profit from the entire thing. And what we see in the 1920s and 1930s is the rise of organized crime. Crime organizations, criminal gangs begin to prosper because of prohibition. Now, there had been organized crime in the United States prior to prohibition. It was very much localized and it was on a much, much smaller scale. But when alcohol became illegal, it provided opportunity for these organized crime figures to increase their, their profits, increase their reach, increase their criminal activity. This growth of criminal enterprises and organized crime did lead to spates of violence. You can look at Chicago in the 1920s becomes infamous for its gangland wars, such as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen. So prohibition did give a tremendous boost to the rise and functioning and profitability of organized crime in the 1920s and 30s. Now, who is perhaps the most famous of the organized crime underworld figures to emerge from the prohibition era? But one, Alphonse Capone from Chicago. Al Capone is um, a legendary criminal figure in the United States. He, at the height of his power in the late 1920s, essentially controlled everything that happened in the city of Chicago. His criminal organization eliminated his rivals. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was conducted by uh, Capone's group. He controlled the government in Chicago. He had judges and police officers and, and uh, captains and city aldermen on his payroll. Uh, he was raking in millions of dollars a year from controlling the alcohol distribution in Chicago and in the greater Chicago area. Capone, of course, is the most famous of these uh, mobster figures of the 1920s and 30s, but he certainly was not the only one. There were many others who make names for themselves and, and become tremendously uh, notorious and famous individuals, including people like Lucky Luciano and Bugs Moran and Nucky Johnson. Nucky Johnson, at the height of his power, virtually controlled the entire state of New Jersey. 
Uh, if you recall the um, HBO series, Boardwalk Empire, that is kind of a fictionalized account of the, the exploits of Nucky Johnson. And you had Meyer Lansky, who is credited with um, throwing or controlling the, the 1919 Black Sox World Series, and Arnold Rothstein, a banker to the mobsters. So all of these individual figures gain prominence, gain uh, profit because of prohibition and because they figured out ways to to uh, control the distribution of alcohol and to provide the product that American consumers wanted, the booze, the liquor, the beer. So we see the rise of organized crime and the flourishing of or organized crime during this time period. Uh, the federal government, of course, does try to fight back against organized crime. They do establish various bureaus to try to, to crack down on the criminal activity to hunt down some of these gangsters. Uh, famously, there was a man named Elliot Ness who worked for the Treasury Department who uh, was trying to take down Al Capone. If you remember the TV show or the movie, The Untouchables, that's a fictionalized account of Elliot Ness and his, his group of agents. Um, but the criminal underworld did manage to survive, did, did manage to profit, did manage for the most part to avoid um, getting into direct trouble with the federal government. Now, what about Al Capone? What happens to Al Capone? Al Capone does eventually get arrested. He does eventually pr face prosecution and he does eventually end up in prison. He actually serves time in Alcatraz in San Francisco. But what was it that got Al Capone it wasn't his control of the rackets. It wasn't his, his involvement with the distribution of alcohol or uh, murdering his rivals or controlling prostitution or any of that stuff. Al Capone got in trouble for income tax evasion. That's always what's going to get you. The Fed is going to get theirs, and we see that with the story of Al Capone. Uh, he does end up in Alcatraz. When he leaves prison, he uh, ends up retiring to his estate in South Florida, where he dies an agonizingly painful death, uh, his brain basically turning to mush because he suffered from syphilis. But uh, Al Capone is one of these prominent um, gangsters that does gain power and prestige during the period of, of um, prohibition. Well, how do we assess prohibition then? Was it working? Was prohibition successful? We can look at what the uh, journalist and writer H.L. Mencken said about prohibition. He was writing in 1925. And what he stated was that five years of prohibition have had at least this one benign effect. They have completely disposed of all the favorite arguments of the prohibitionists. There is not less drunkenness in the Republic, but more. There is not less crime, but more. There is not less insanity, but more. The cost of government is not smaller, but vastly greater. Respect for law has not increased, but diminished. He basically dismantles the arguments that the temperance crusaders, that the prohibitionists had had. They said, get rid of alcohol and everything will be rosy in the United States. Crime will go down and insanity will go down and drunkenness will disappear. But what Mencken was pointing out was that in fact, the opposite happened. Crime became more, uh, more dramatic with those gangland wars in Chicago, in New York, in Boston, and other places. People were desiring alcohol in greater number, in greater amounts. So people were breaking the law to get alcohol. Enforcing prohibition became tremendously expensive for the government. Plus, the government wasn't making the excise taxes from the booze as they had been before prohibition. So they were losing money and they were spending more money in trying to enforce the law. So Mencken pointed out that prohibition, even by 1925, was failing miserably. Yet there were some successes in the prohibition movement. Studies have shown that cases of cirrhosis of the liver decreased during the period of prohibition. And uh, incidences of violent alcohol-related crimes decreased during the era of prohibition. But in general, prohibition was met with resistance. People were not necessarily happy about it, and it wasn't working out the way it was planned. So what we begin to see by the, 19, the middle of the 1920s, and particularly the late 1920s, are protests against prohibition. Now, we have to consider the economic situation in the United States at this time. By 1929, the American economy that had been booming for much of the 1920s goes into a free fall. We enter into the Great Depression. And 
one of the, the things that the American public desired during the Great Depression was the ability to purchase alcohol, to have a drink legally. The uh, opponents of prohibition said, you know what, if we allow breweries to begin work, if we begin allow distilleries to conduct their operations, that would be creating jobs for the American public. People would be able to have a job. They would be producing this thing that was very much in demand and it would help the economy and it would help the American people. So what we begin to see, particularly after 1929, are more and more and more protests against prohibition, more calls for a repeal of the prohibition amendment. You see these two images on the screen, people saying, we want beer a very uh, straightforward sentiment. And these other images uh, of Americans demanding an end to prohibition, asking for the ability to buy a drink, for uh, jobs to be created. The image on the left is particularly poignant because what that is is a group of World War I veterans who are making the claim, you know, we went to Europe to fight for liberty and then we come home and we can't even have a drink. Or saying, you know what? All of those foreign ships, those British ships and those French ships are now carrying all of the commerce that American ships could be carrying if not for prohibition. So there were arguments to be made against the continuance of prohibition in the United States. Well, 1932 is a presidential election year and uh, President Hoover, who was in office at that time, was tremendously unpopular because of his mishandling of the early years of the Great Depression. He was being challenged uh, by the Democratic nominee, the former governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And one of Roosevelt's campaign platforms in the election of 1932 was a repeal of the Prohibition Amendment, a repeal of the 18th Amendment. So uh, when the American people voted in November of 1932, Roosevelt ends up winning a dramatic victory. Hoover is soundly defeated and Roosevelt takes office in March of 1933. When Roosevelt takes office, we begin to see movement in Congress to actually formally repeal the Prohibition Amendment. That would eventually come to fruition later in 1933, in December of 1933, when the 21st Amendment is ratified. What does the 21st Amendment do? Well, it's all right there in the, the first section of it. It says, the 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. The 18th Amendment, the Prohibition Amendment, no longer in effect. But it does note that the transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. Basically what that was saying is that the states can still have prohibition. Towns, counties, localities can still have their own prohibition in their locality, but national prohibition no longer existed in the United States after the ratification of the 21st Amendment. Well, when the 21st Amendment was ratified in December of 1933, there were scenes of joyousness across the country. People flocked to the bars, people flocked to the uh, liquor stores to try to celebrate, to try to, to commemorate the end of that experiment of prohibition. You see some images on the screen, the uh, front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer, prohibition's 14 year rule ended, uh, the Daily Mirror there, prohibition ends at last, and that, that crowd in the bar with the sign that says farewell 18th Amendment. I'm always st struck by that image because that woman in the foreground is holding an enormous uh, cauldron of beer. Um, so she was really celebrating her, uh, the repeal of prohibition there in that time. So what we see by 1933 is that prohibition had run its course. The attempt to eliminate sin in the United States by getting rid of what was a perceived cause of sin and social disturbance failed miserably. And uh, across the United States, people celebrated the fact that prohibition had come to an end and that, yes, in fact, happy days were beer again. And that is my uh, brief history of prohibition in the United States, the reason why it existed, how it went, and the outcome of prohibition. So if people have questions, I uh, look forward to hearing them. I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, presentation. Now, I don't know if the historical society would be 
interested or would have the resources to do something like that, this, but it might be interesting to see the effect of prohibition directly here in Foxborough. Uh, to find out who supported Prohibition, to find out where the speakeasies were in town and who we knew was distributing and bootlegging in this region. So um, if a, an enterprising high school student or a local college student wants to undertake an interesting study of American history, that might be an avenue for uh, inquiry. All right, well, once again, I'd like to thank the uh, Foxborough Historical Society for giving me this opportunity. Um, hopefully, next time I talk to you, we will all actually be in person. Um, Stay safe out there, wear your masks, uh, get your vaccine when you can, and I will see you somewhere down the road. Thank you.